Can you guys come just down a little? It's easier. Yeah. It's like fucking uh, oh, Fangorn Forest in here. <laughs> um, I was thinking we could uh, we could like harmonize a hello. So Steve Forrest, me, me second. Yeah. Let me start. Yeah. Hello. 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 And welcome to OSW Review, the old school wrestling video podcast. <laughs> it was amazing. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Timing. Filled with glorious grapple vision and encoded with blast processing, we chronologically critique wrestling storylines pay per view by pay per view. This is your host, Jay Hunter, joined as ever by the second coming of the Killer Bees. It's the Fumbly Bumblies, <laughs> V1. That's the story. And Mr. OOC. Aha, kick up your heels and pollute your britches. It's the two towers of the David Arquette trilogy. It's April 26, 2000 edition of WCW Thunder. And it's coming up. (laughs) 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 Fuck you, Steve. Once again, Noggers. Happy days are here again. Power pies. <laughs> uh, great to have you back, OSC. Thanks very much. How was the last show? Oh, the last show was ready to rumble, wasn't it? Um, no. No. Don't leave us. Don't leave us. Yeah, great. Yeah, why not? Where you, you big sneak off going away on holidays? It wasn't a holiday. All right. Going away. <laughs> uh, how was CD for K? Uh, what did he sound like over there? Do you actually sound anything? I can't like do it. All I can do is CD for K. All right. So it's like I say potato, you say potato. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. Uh, did they have any breakfast rolls? <laughs> um, I don't eat breakfast. Ah, that's knackered. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I was thinking before we start, why don't we get everyone up to speed with a quick jump through the history of WCW. Um, a quick? <laughs> a quick one! Yes, a quick jump through the history of WCW and then just the major changes right into the last few months. Awesome. World Championship Wrestling! In 1988, Ted Turner purchases Jim Crockett Promotions and rebrands it World Championship Wrestling, WCW. 1991, Bischoff joins WCW as an announcer. And in 1993, WCW President Bill Watts resigned and thanks to his TV background and corporate savvy, Eazy-E took his place. In 1994, Bischoff was fully put in charge of WCW and convinced Turner and Warner Brothers execs to hire big name ex-WWF talent who signed big money contracts with Creative Control, a deal that would hurt WCW badly later on. So in 1995, we got the debut of Monday Nitro, a one-hour live broadcast featuring big-name talent at the top and, for the first time on mainstream US television, Cruiserweights at the bottom. WCW also expanded their pay-per-view offerings and WWF followed suit. In 96... After seeing New Japan's cross-promotional war with UWFI, Bischoff struck gold with the New World Order, an invading force which was comprised of ex-WWF wrestlers, inferring that the WWF had come to kill WCW, bringing with it a new gritty, realistic edge, and with it, the Attitude Era. And to say this changed wrestling forever is quite an understatement. We're still feeling it today. Woo! (laughs) Gone were the neon cartoony gimmicks, and in with jeans and black t-shirts, 
real names and gang warfare, bringing about uh, the birth of cool heels, which are bad guys who generally got more cheers than the good guys. WCW was on fire, decimating WWF in the ratings war on Monday nights, and despite lots of screwy finishes, not building many stars, and running the NWO gimmick into the ground, WCW did mega business, beating WWF Raw's ratings every Monday for 84 weeks in a row, from the birth of the New World Order, Hall and Nash, in July 96, to roundabout Austin being crowned champion at WrestleMania 14 in 98. WCW had been losing money every year until these golden years of 97 and 98. WCW didn't see a downturn in business until about April 99. But when that hit, it hit very hard. So 1999, 1999 saw a major downturn in business for WCW, their hot streak had ran out and while spending was still at a blazing $150 million, their profits, buy rates and TV ratings were way, way down, which caused major behind the scenes changes. So in September that year, they sent Eric Bischoff home because he was being held accountable for WCW's mounting losses. So instead of profiting $45 million in 98, they were losing $15 million in 99. He was replaced by their then accountant, Bill Bush. And in October, Bush brought in Russo and his mate Ed Ferrara from the WWF as head writer. His vision was that more is more. So more title changes, more swerves, more gimmick matches, more storylines, quicker feuds. Just... Everything you can do in wrestling, do it and do it ten times faster. And, and and then when the fans get used to more, it's like, we need even more and more. Yeah. Disaster. Just three months later, in January 2000, Bush had had enough of Russo's car crash TV style. The breaking point was Russo suggesting Tank Abbott should win the WCW title. And was offered a demotion to be part of a committee of creative he went home instead and just got paid. So he was replaced by Kevin Sullivan, and along with Terry Taylor and Bob Mould, they were even worse than Russo. <laughs> <laughs> so in April, WCW brought back Russo and Bischoff in the hopes that they together, they'd be able to keep each other in check and save WCW. Vince Russo is back in charge again. They're on the same side? All titles will be stripped tonight. It'll be a brand new playing field. So now on to April 10th, 2000 was the reboot Nitro, where Russo and Bischoff returned on screen and hit the reset switch, vacating all of the championship belts. Their new plan to get over a younger talent was to have a company-wide feud with the heel New Blood, which was either like younger, new or mid-card talent, headed by Russo and Bischoff, versus the face Millionaires Club, consisting of established veteran talent with Flair, Luger, Sting, Hogan, those lads. So, are you heel? Alright, you're part of the new blood. And are you a veteran face? Alright, you're the Millionaires Club. WCW held tournament title matches six days later at the Spring Stampede pay-per-view. Um, so it's all, all of this is new blood versus Millionaires Club. The heel new blood won all of the championships except for the hardcore title, which is won by Terry Funk. Um, so we'll just see how this company-wide feud develops and how their members paired up for feuds during the episode. And was it their goal to get the new blood over? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you tried to run me over with the Hummer. Well, I'll tell you what, Terry. You bring the yellow and I'll supply the red. Your blood. I want out of this marriage. I'll sign these papers. As soon as I shove him down oh. your throat. Watch out from behind! No! David Arcade is in the ring! If I pin you, DDP, get the shot at Jeff Jarrett for the title! You want it? You got it! Things like the spider said to the fly. My God! Come. <laughs> he looks like a pinata from hell! This ball on the line right now. Fish off at Arcade. No! 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 He worked out Fish off! One, One two, three! three. Jared will defend the world title against Diamond Dallas Page in a steel cage. Diamond Cutter, he never saw it coming. Also ripped the door off the cage. Referee down to count one, two, can you, you, you dance? 
He's trying to stop the count. Three. He got the three count. He got the three count. He got the three count. Thunder opens up with a really helpful opening montage of the current storylines. Seeing Kidman mention the White Hummer and Hulk Hogan, oh, I was like, we made the right choice. <laughs> WCW 2000. Jumping in at the right time, totally. Jarrett manhandles David Arquette, who had been seen in the crowd previously and was friends with DDP. Jarrett considers a front face lock, but he just like holds on to his head. Yeah. And Jarrett's with heel Eric Bischoff and Kimberly Page. I, I was like, I'm so glad we did this show before doing the pay-per-view. Because what's happening with yeah, everything? Yeah, Jesus Christ. We'd have been absolutely lost if we didn't do this show. But, well, I'd still lost. But even the promo package, I was just, all right, calm down. Everyone, calm down. <laughs> Slow it down. What the fuck are you doing? Is this, this is classic Russo, basically. This is like him at his kind of peak of craziness. It's like, oh, Raw's going far too slow. Yeah. Let's just like book an extra hour's worth of program and squeeze it into two hours. Like. Yeah. And so to get us up to speed, at Spring Stampede, DDP's wife Kimberly turned on Paige and helped Jeff Jarrett to become the new WCW champion and leader of the New Blood. Eight days later, on the 24th of April Nitro, DDP won the title back in a steel cage match on Nitro. And now here we are, three days later at Thunder. Jarrett's hot after losing his title and uses Arquette as leverage to book a tag match between Jarrett and Bischoff versus DDP and Arquette for the WCW title. With DDP is one of his best mates, Positive Lee Canyon. Or is he Champagne Chris Canyon? Champagne. The two had remained mates despite their faction, the Jersey Triad, which was those two with Bam Bam Bigelow, uh, had split last year. Thunder here, it's obviously... Um, pre-taped the censors bleep out the word screw as in screw you what do you say Paige? the way i see it you don't have a damn choice you jared me Whoa. me yes. oh no 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 you Paige. maybe they were thinking if we blank it out completely they'll think we said fuck <laughs> you might want to change the camera angle yeah. also you know to not show his mouth ridiculous the heels force their hand with their muscle, Buff Bagwell and Shane Douglas, your boy, who are immediately trumped by Lex Luger. <laughs> this is like your favourite segment we've ever done, Shirley. This is amazing. But why is Ric Flair in the foreground? Get back. <laughs> the resulting schmoz leaves DDP in the ring with Kimberly, who after an Eva Marie level slap, ends up scooching on her knees and delivering a theatrical low blow. Afterwards, Heenan quips that Kimberly's made the right decision in her life. Not managing the WCW champion anymore. <laughs> Mr. Fuji levels of stupidity here. <laughs> she, she, like, she was far too late with her low blow. Like DDP, and he was too quick as well. He was getting out of the ring, so it looked really bad. Yeah, she's very hot, by the way. Oh, man. Holy fucking shit. Wasn't there rumours of, like, you know, DDP, Kimberly, Bischoff and his wife doing a bit of wife swapping. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. In the old sooty bum. What was that film she's in? Didn't her, like, tit pop out in a film? It was, like, 40-year-old virgin, maybe? There was uh, speed yes. dating? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Splicey spice. Splicey spice. I'm the greatest. Come on. It's Ernest the Cat Miller versus Bam Bam Bigelow, or Big Bum Begelow. He was looking in terrible shape, by the way. Yeah, he didn't give a bollocks by yeah. this point. Too many jambo rolls. <laughs> Somebody call my mama. Mean Gene is with Ernest the Cat Miller, whose gimmick is a light-hearted dancing idiot who bats away his feud with Bam Bam, possibly Russo and Bischoff, and 
hardcore champion Terry Funk. He's more interested in dancing and runs through a lot of dancing puns. It's very 90s, isn't it? Where someone has like a well of puns they go to, like Earthquake would always be on the Richter scale and the model might do tennis things and Jarrett's there and his his gimmick is wanking, you know. <laughs> what a ridiculous gimmick. What? He's got the, the slap nuts thing. Oh, was that wanking? Yeah. Slap nuts. Well, do you slap your nuts and wanking? <laughs> if it was furious, I guess. <laughs> no, and uh, the stroke as well, obviously. He's got the oh, stroke. Oh, I did not get that. Um, the cat calls me Jean an old man. That's a that's a bit like. I think pot. he looks just as old as that's it. State of the cat, black, yeah. Like. Terrible image, terrible body. Like he's not in good shape at all. And WCW with their rip off themes with his big James Brown rip off. Was like, mm. oh, this gimmick, man. Wait, well, like, was this guy over? No. Ever? Well, you can hear it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shavante recaps the storyline. Thank you very much. Bam Bam Pearl harbored Miller during an interview segment at Spring Stampede and also interfered in his match, so Miller cost him his hardcore title match against Terry Funk. All of these feuds would have just started like April 10th Nitro, so the reset button with taking away all the championships, also cutting all the feuds, and here's some new ones. He fumbles through his promo. I saw your mom out back, and your presences are bigger than hers. Oh, oh boy. By saying that, you're just slagging your mask. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your ma's not listening. <laughs> Nobody calls yeah. her mama. And Bam Bam's like, how dare you? How how dare you slag your ma? <laughs> how dare you say my tits? No, no, no he wasn't going about the tits. <laughs> Stacy Keebler, Miss Hancock, very subtle, hilarious, is taking notes. But who side is she on? Thank you. Distraction finish and Miller hits the feed liner, a roundhouse standing sidekick for the win in 108. We forgot something there, Steve. Steve! <laughs> what bar is Ernest Miller? <laughs> I have a catch bar dark. And uh, remember the secret bars? Nice. Yeah, they were like kind of gold wrapper, they kind of like, I, almost like. Tiger printy. There's like little mm. lines through them. That's all I've got. Clearly nobody let us in on the secret. Oh. Oh. I've also oh, got cheeky. one for um, Kimberly Page as well. She was wearing some whopper fucking get up, wasn't she? Mm. Nice. Uh, it was a bit of a Bret Hart, I don't know. With the, it's like a whore Bret Hart. Mm. Bret Hart. <laughs> Bret Hart. Bret Hart. <laughs> I like it. Because it, like it. it was pink and it, it was a bit of what do you call the fluff around the sides? Fluff? <laughs> <laughs> Steve! <laughs> what bar is Kimberly Page? <laughs> well, Jay, Kimberly Page is wearing a lovely little pink number, so I've gone for she is a nougat bar. Oh, I like mm. it, yeah. She's a white lady as well. So. Mm. That, and that's it because everyone else is wearing black. Yeah. Well, they're obviously noggers. <laughs> <laughs> Unsheathed <laughs> noggers. Um, you, like, you've been giving her for years about WCW and just everything is black robes, black ring, black... Black and grey. Like, the only colour worse than have everything black is to have everything grey. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? It's like dog vision. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite depressing. Isn't it? It really is. Billy Kidman and real-life girlfriend Tori Wilson arrive backstage. All of the lads are there. Look at that, the BMW Z3. They're just pushing this car as a star. It was ridiculous. <laughs> the state of it. <laughs> I hate that car anyway. It's not like the hairdresser's Porsche or something. No, that's the MR2. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, the engine is so big and heavy and it's up front. Yeah. That is like it's total oversteer when you turn it, like. Yeah. But yeah, the state of it <laughs> in a Z3. I love Tori Wilson. And she's uh, said to be one of the nicest people in wrestling. Mm. Yeah. Although she did play her part in, like, destroying many a wrestler's push, like. Who was it, like, Billy Kidman, uh, Tadgers, who else is that? Tadgers. <laughs> Oh, there's loads of them. Oh, well, she's part of the Send for the Man as well. Like, uh, when 
you know, the Botchmania bit where Macho Man's backstage and he's flipping out and he's like, oh, where's whoever? And she's like, ha ha! And he's he <laughs> her. Hey, Sean Stasiak coming out to a rip on Mr. Perfect's theme. You love these phony cover themes, the don't you? Fuck it. This wasn't even a cover. This was just Mr. Perfect's song. I always thought that that was like a Jim Johnson song. Jim Johnson's was actually a rip on like the theme from Exodus, which uh, is a film. Okay. So it's a rip on a rip. Mm, good stuff. Sean Stasiak calling himself the perfect one. So he returned to WCW on the reboot Nitro 16 days ago after being unceremoniously fired from the WWF for secretly recording locker room conversations. Most notably himself, Steve Blackman and the Bulldog. How was he to benefit from that? He thought it would be a laugh and they'd play it later and let's have a laugh about it. Before that happened, someone found out about it and they went through his purse and it's like... Psh. What the fuck is this? Get out! You know? Yeah. What a nut job. So the, the conversation with British Bulldog. Yeah, I think you know, that they were the... in Montreal and they were just trying to get directions and couldn't find it and shouting at staff and stuff like that. That's it. And he thought it was hilarious, so... No? Uh, did anyway. It, did it prove that there's no bull? <laughs> in this, this British, British Bulldog. bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> they just, on the menu, is there any bull? <laughs> It's Sean Stasiak versus Chris Canyon with Kurt Hennig on commentary. Sean Stasiak calling himself the perfect one. His finisher was the perfect plant, and it's a horrendous looking F5. Beating Hennig clean with it, WCW are trying to gift perfect's gimmick to Stasiak, a feat that's absolutely never worked in modern day, apart from nature boy Mike Mazanin, of course. <laughs> <laughs> He's facing Champagne Chris Canyon. And oh, it's at this point we get to hear the famous Dave Penzer WCW announcer job where everyone is. Did you hear how he pronounces everyone's name? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> everyone. Splicey, splicey. Splicey, splicey. Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> Whether you want to one up each other because there's so much at stake. Oh. A special girl against Terry Funk, only natural. Obviously, the team of very close personal friend of Pete. Did he turn on Hulk Hogan with a chair? The ring, and as they come here, Mike today, Bobby the Brain, full of courage and guts. <laughs> <laughs> Coming down to commentate is. Mr. Perfect. Is Kurt Hennig. Is <laughs> <laughs> What is the deal with the music in this company, lads? Dude, it's <laughs> shit. The most generic country yeah. bollocks you'll ever hear. And what's going on here tonight? His close friend Diamond Dallas Page is the world champion. But there's panic in the back to find David Arquette. How's anyone supposed to get over to this? Listen, I got this CD in the mail. <laughs> and I need to save money somewhere. It's not coming out of Hogan's 700 grand per appearance. <laughs> I know it was cool to get rid of gimmicks and just have real people, but Kurt Hennig wasn't very interesting. No, he's not. That's the kind of music that Kurt, a Kurt Hennig would have. Yeah. Give him a fucking gimmick. This is exactly what I think of when ex WWE wrestlers come into WCW. You've lost your gimmick, you're now in jeans, you're in a black shirt, no prestige, no class. You're in worse shape because mm. you don't care as much. Your matches are never as good because it doesn't matter as much. Because you're already paid. Because And you're already paid. Heenan's supposed to be healed, but his actual friendship with Hennig comes out. That was quite nice. Mm. In the ring, Stasiak squashes Canyon and poses. Hennig gets over not needing to use these brass knucks and then uses them. So Canyon could hit his finisher. It's like the I'll take a rock bottom. Oh yeah, the self rock bottom. Yeah, yeah. 
and Stasiak gets the win in 241. Mike Awesome hits the ring, he's healed, so he's part of the new blood, and delivers a sick German suplex to Canyon, and then power bombs him through the table. Classic Mike Awesome. Other people take nasty bumps so he can get over. Yeah. And in the end, it doesn't matter because when he does get his pop, he can never follow it up with like a gripping promo or anything. So it basically he hits his move and then the pop dies and then he's like, oh, bollocks, the pop is gone. Oh, I better hit like a nastier power bomb through a table this time. Yeah, I suck. I just yeah. took no time for that man. I just I mean he's like for the size of him he's very good. He's he's an agile man and he's a big powerful man, but he's no charisma, he's no character, no. he's no he's star making ability. A mullet, like, you know, he, looks <laughs> <laughs> he has a mullet in two thousand. Yeah, that's it. He he looks stupid. Yeah. yeah. Then Mike Average remembers he's a heel and the two beat up Hennig until DDP cleans house and announces he's accepted the world title defence in a tag match. Stupid man. What kind of idiot lets himself be talked into putting his belt on the line in a tag match? Aren't faces stupid, mm. though? And lead with their heart. Oh, my God. It's and I need to defend his honour, the honour of David Arquette. I don't know whether that's just a wrestling thing or if that's an America thing. It's, but like, it still happens to this day. Cena and, you know, cannot turn down a challenge. But, again, this is, like, just... I can't keep up. Perfect attack Stasiak after the match and then Awesome comes out to attack Canyon and then DDP comes out to attack Stasiak. All this is about two minutes. I can't yeah. keep up with this. It's the, the greatest night ever spent on Monday Night Show. Billy Kidman cuts an in-ring promo. Himself and Awesome beat up Hogan on Nitro. He gloats about putting Hulk Hogan in hospital and issues an open challenge. He just he comes out and says that he beat him and he put Hogan out of business. Hulkamania is gone. <laughs> just, you're Billy Kidman. It's not. <laughs> it's really not gone. Anywhere. Hulk Hogan's music hits and Hogan comes out. That's right. Horace Hogan. Oh, yes. Horace Hogan against the BK Bomber. This is going to be great. Michael Balea, yeah, he's actually legitimately Hogan's nephew and Mike Awesome's cousin. Do you know the way we were annoyed with uh, Gully Bully, their uh, Curtis Axel, you know, Michael McGill Buddy? <laughs> Gully Bully. <laughs> and how we, you know, we're annoyed, why aren't you going around as Joe Hennig, you know? But I was looking at Horace Hogan, and it's like, you shouldn't be called Horace Hogan, you're dragging Hogan down. Like, if Hogan leaves the company, you could be Horace Hogan, but not when he's around. Same with, like, David Flair. It's like David Flair being around brings down Ric Flair. Big time. Just call him David Bully, Gully Bully. <laughs> Gully Bully. <laughs> this is Horace Hogan's big return from a knee injury. So, much like in the WWF, Heenan rags on Hulk at every opportunity. It's like, why did Brett hit Hogan with a steel chair on Nitro? Because he deserved it. And everyone should hit Hogan with a chair. <laughs> and Horace is a mooch. Hogan didn't raise him. He couldn't raise a sweat. <laughs> Did you notice that they're both wearing the exact same wrestling gear? That pissed me off. Eight people on this show wore jorts and some form of t-shirt or vest or top. <laughs> that was the style at the time. Fuck. Everyone is John Cena. I've noted Horace looks like a fucking bum out of Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> He's also terrible in ring. Kidman gets the lion's share of offense in this short match until Horace hits possibly the worst scoop slam in history. This is Bischoff's cue to Ender. After his worst scoop slam ever, he follows it up with a fucking desperate press slam where he's so weak that he can't lift him over his head. So he lifts up like one side and he's like lopsided and then he tries to press him and it's just flat out not going to happen. So no, I'll just drop him. Like. So then he uh, picks up Billy Kidman and hits him with a fucking nasty powerbomb. Like pure Mike Awesome indie cunt powerbomb. I'm really shit, but I'm going to get myself over by actually hurting you. Despite the entire reason for wrestling is to, you know, not hurt someone. Disgraceful wrestler. 
Fuck this guy, I am written down here. <laughs> Horace sets up a table and runs wild. Ah, oh, it's terrible. Until Tori hits a low blow, which Horace no sells. Second female low blow of the night. Kidman uses Bischoff's distraction to hit a Dudley dog through the table, which is on the outside, and Easy makes the quick pin. Grant, <laughs> heel Kidman wins in 534. Yeah, terrible chair shot as well. You know, if you're going to do a bad chair shot, change the camera angle. Yes. Do you know he, at the start of the show, he actually, he actually mentions the Hummer, the white Hummer. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that's about? Is this the one with the Big Show and Hogan with the cars? No, that's, or is that's, that's, so- that's something else. Oh that's, God. The, that's the monster they truck, They did Mark. two of these <laughs> gimmicks. Jesus Christ. We got all this money. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, the Hummer angle from June 99. I'm dying to hear about this. It was where Randy Savage set up Nash... And Nash was in the limo, and that was T-boned by a mysterious white Hummer. But who's driving the Hummer? Rikishi. <laughs> <laughs> Months passed without an answer to the driver's identity, and it was bounced around from Carmen Electra to Sid Vicious. Maybe it was Hulk Hogan. Maybe it was Sting. And actually, just stop asking. <laughs> Sorry. A name sticks out a quite a bit. Carmen Electra. <laughs> Did they try to sign her and shit like oh, yeah, that? This or? was the angle to bring her in. Like that was the initial thought, but then that fell through. And <laughs> well, well, what? Why was she trying to kill Kevin Nash? <laughs> what are you gonna? What are you gonna ask me about this? <laughs> 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 Nobody knows these answers. There's oh, probably man. like a 15 minute window in the entirety of the existence where Russo would know the answer, <laughs> and that's it. So it was never revealed? No, no. But almost a year later, it was dredged up by Kidman, and he implied that it was Bischoff. And that went nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> hell. So and so was this a shoot, or was this written into the story? Well, why not? Why the <laughs> fuck not? <laughs> but the best part is that they'd have video footage, and the white Homer turns into a black Homer, and then back into a white Homer again. <laughs> Uh, so much like who was behind those GTV segments or who lifted the briefcase at King of the Ring 99, it's one of those wrestling storylines that goes unanswered. It's a wrestling legend, I guess. What was the GTV? <laughs> and they call you the Big Show? <laughs> Uh, there are backstage like security camera footage that's not Sean Stasiak, but they did <laughs> show uh, heels in collusion and stuff like that. This was Raw, right? Yeah, GTV. Yeah, TV. but they yeah. did it on some pay-per-views as well. No, like, sorry, just uh, just in case you didn't know, like it wasn't WCW. Like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And what was the briefcase? King of the Ring 99 was Vince and Shane versus Stone Cold for the uh, control of the WWF. The papers were in the briefcase. You know, it's a ladder match. And Austin was going to win. And oh, he the... holds it up. And it goes... Doo, 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 yeah, yeah. You know, so when he gets down, it goes... Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sure, Shane got it anyway. And it's like, oh my God, who lifted the briefcase? You know? And they just... Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> they just dropped it dead in the water. It's like um, when Booker T got the note. Like, I know what you did last summer. Like, a week later, pff, gone. <laughs> finished. Why Why would you start a storyline before the end is mapped out? I can't wrap my head around why, the type why, of person who would... Why are you going to would... be so negative, Steve? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we can totally figure it out by Wednesday. Because when you're not, companies go out of business. <laughs> I'm here to keep companies from going out of business. <laughs> Alright, so next up we've got a Tank Abbott Mark Merrow segment. Hard cut to Tank Abbott coming to the ring. Awesome. In in an awful way. <laughs> His music again. <laughs> God. What's with this company? It just generic rock. I mean, me, 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 me. I guarantee you it was nothing like that. Um, but that was way. I mean, me, 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 me. <laughs> He also looks like <laughs> Horace Hogan as well. <laughs> he does. I mean, me, 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 me. <laughs> Ooh, 
Ooh, you may know Tank Abbott from season three of Friends. Where, <laughs> where <laughs> as opposed to the MMA, <laughs> the one where Monica's a cunt. <laughs> That does not narrow it down. I <laughs> know. <laughs> uh, please tell me what episode of Friends this is. Where Monica's boyfriend competes in the UFC and Abbott jobs him out by apparently stepping on his neck for 20 minutes. Former UFC fighter, Tank Abbott, MMA record of... I'd say 10 and 7. 10 wins, 15 losses. Oh, God. Yes, Mr. Abbott was brought into WCW in late 99. He was brought in to be fed to Goldberg in a kind of tough wrestler versus legit fighter gimmick. At the time, Goldberg was out with a serious arm injury from (laughs) deeply lacerating his arm from punching a legit car window. And he refused to use like a hidden pipe in his uh, sleeve and uh, yeah, almost lost his arm. (laughs) He was, like, a, about an inch away from uh, permanent nerve damage. Like. What a fucking idiot, like. And he did it. To How be long a was he out for? Um, it was, like, six months or something. Was that long? Holy oh, shit. Did it kill his heat, like? <laughs> it's a bit of a spoiler, but when he comes back, um, Russo had something major planned because he thought he'd gotten one of the WWF guys to come over. They didn't come. I promised something big. Goldberg heel turn. (laughs) (laughs) Abbott's got Ryback's bully gimmick. He finds Mark Merrow and famed boxing trainer Ray Rinaldi and they shove each other. Much like Awesome sharing the ring and then walking past Face Hennig only to return later to beat him up. So after shoving Abbott, Rinaldi nonchalantly walks into the ring because his next spot will be in the ring. It looked really odd because WCW, they don't block out their spots and they don't tightly script how the show is going to go. So it just looks awkward. Mm. (laughs) Bollocks. Anyway, Mero and Abbott go to fisticuffs in the ring until WCW's wurzels break them up. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Yeah, they uh, have a shoot fight. Mm. And by the way, Mero looked like he was way out of his depth. Oh, he'd be annihilated by this guy, yeah, yeah. Did they not see how Brawl for All went for WWF in 99? Mm. It, like, really, really hurt the WWF and Mark yeah. Gunn that he got KTFO in first round in about 20 seconds by Butterbean. Fucking Butterbean, like. Ah, oh, it's awful. What did you think of um, Abbott's awesome promo? Hey, Ghostberg. <laughs> It's actually a cool name. <laughs> Jewish like ghost, like ghost dog, <laughs> ghost mutt, ghost mutt dog. <laughs> it's like yeah, because he was like Goldberg. Why don't you wrestle me? Wrestle me, Goldberg. Please wrestle me, Goldberg. 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 It's like Eric Bischoff was like, "Hey Vince, do you want to wrestle with me at Slambury? Vince, come on, wrestle me at Slambury. I'll, I'll give you some money." Yeah, it's, it's not sure. Or or he's not the gonna uh, wrestle. Uh, Voodoo Kin Mafia. That's right. <laughs> With uh, DX. What a joke. I'll give you a million dollars if you show up on pay per view. Yeah, Sean and Hunter, we're gonna be at the Alamo this Sunday waiting on you all day. <laughs> so, and I would have paid to see them like sitting down on a bench, like. <laughs> Hour 18. No sign of their <laughs> So next up we have Sting versus The Wall. Christ, two days after getting a bloodbath, Sting appears backstage still covered in blood. I he hasn't showered, manky fucker. This is when wrestling is like at its worst. You know when it expects you to believe that the instant the show ends and the next show kicks off, the time in between those two points does not exist. Yeah. It's like a black hole when you fold the fucking space time continuum <laughs> over yeah. and you just lose five days. Like yeah. it's it's amazing. See, but if you're watching this on Netflix, it'd be grand. <laughs> <laughs> Tanae makes the amazing call and says, Oh it's Sting! He's still covered in red Blood? <laughs> no, technically was it supposed to be blood? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it was a well, bloodbath, like you know. A new blood, bloodbath. Yeah. But um, um, I think it's a really cool idea. It's one of those ideas. It looks great. Yeah, we're yeah. it's we like us sitting around a table. Oh, this sounds awesome, and not thinking it through logically. But we we would think it through logically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And get a shower, mate. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Shavante says he looks like he walked off the set of a remake of Carrie. Funnily enough, there is a remake of Carrie yeah. out this year. October 2013. Borden will not be acting in it. His theme, <laughs> his theme song is Metallica's Seek and Destroy. Yes, so Sting, he's wrestling the wall. He was initially brought in as Alex Wright's Heavy in 1999 as Berlin and the Wall. God. <laughs> I just have it written here. Stay of this fella. I bet you he's shite. <laughs> <laughs> I think this guy of, of big, you know, enormous men, right? <laughs> it sounds worse than I thought it would. As in your Kurgans, your giant Gonzalez's, your great Callies. He looks kind of normal, just big. Yeah. But that's what you don't want to be when you're that size in wrestling because you're useless. Cause you know, like you're not small enough to actually work, but you don't look like a freak. And that's what is the draw when you get to be like above a certain oh, size. Okay. So maybe that's like the worst way to be in wrestling. Yeah. Well, at least you get a job or a tryout. Yes, you know, that's true. Easier that's true. in the door. Since the wall stank, he was given a generic big man finisher, the choke slam. He was taken off TV after his shtick with Berlin fizzled and returned in January's sold out in 2000 as a generic singles wrestler as seen by his gimmickless plain black garb. Sting here needs no introduction. One of WCW's all-time biggest draws and proudest accomplishments and respected veterans. Sting is feuding with Vampiro, if you were asking. They had a short-lived alliance as the Brothers in Paint earlier that year, but Vamp turned on him and are continuing this as part of the New Blood Millionaires Club angle. Uh, so this is a tables match, just cause. Shavante's commentary was all over the place in this match. At one point he says that Sting looks like a zombie and, you know, he's walking out and he's all, you know, slow and chill like that. And then at a different point he says, oh, he snapped. He's gone crazy. And then he goes back to like saying, yeah, he's, he's all like stoic and whatnot. So just really bad commentary. Sting works the topple the big man down match, working to get Wall off his feet. It includes botching a sunset flip to the outside. Falling right on his arse. Oh, so bad. And then, like a fuck, a big indie geek, he just gets right back up and goes straight back to the same move with the fucking wall thing hanging on there like a fucking arsehole. Like, oh, I'm not going to like do anything because it's not in the script. I mean, he fucking fell. Stand on his face. Yeah, like, yeah, you, you know yeah. what I mean? Yep. Shit, a man. It's the finishing spot. Yeah, he's not doing that sunset flip again. So he just repeats the spot and power bombs him through the table, winning the match at 1 minute 20. The wall no sells it in shock as Vampiro Pearl Harbor Sting. Stinger cleans house, standing tall, and the commentators talk up how unstoppable he is and how this bloodbath has put him in a trance. It's the ad break questionarium. What kind of Homer was used in WCW? I like to enjoy the finer things in life. And I'm definitely the stuff. I've got my WCW MasterCard. <laughs> Get the official WCW MasterCard. To apply for yours today, just call 1-800-532-WCW2. Featuring new designs, great rates, and all the benefits that go along with it. Get it? <laughs> yes! To apply for yours, just call 1-800-532-WCW2 right now. Look out! It's the mutant psycho savage, no mercy demolition spray! Legion of Doom! What do road warriors wear on the road to destruction? Bruce. Bruce! Shoes for your feet, pockets for your stuff. The question is, what kind of Homer was used in WCW? The answer is... Sodibum. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No one will ever get that. <laughs> Are we going to have to splice? We're just trolling people yeah. now. <laughs> what bum <laughs> is he? <laughs> Jay, 
he is a soddy bomb. <laughs> Can you explain to our audience what a soddy bomb is? <laughs> is a bumful of soap so sauce. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's where the soap goes. Yeah, it's time for Vince Russo, baby. <laughs> so next up, we've got a new blood and millionaires club Russo flair segment. The leader of the new blood is with the franchise Shane Douglas and Buff Bagwell. They get the cheapest of cheap heat saying Syracuse sucks and it's not part of New York. Yes, it is. The, <laughs> <laughs> the crowd don't care. Buff says he's facing the total package Lex Luger at Slamboree, and Douglas says he's shooting and he'll get Flair's ass franchised. Wouldn't that mean he gets loads of Flair's ass <laughs> all over the country? <laughs> People pay Douglas a few, you know, like a few quid, and they get their very own Flair ass. <laughs> also, why the fuck is Shane Douglas in a group called the New Blood? He's old and fat yeah. and shit. <laughs> yeah just like uh, we can't make you a face you don't work as a face you're going to be heels uh, that's shit Douglas had a long standing one sided beef with Flair and they traded snippy remarks over their careers instead of cutting back and forth to the heels in the ring and the faces on the ramp they put the heels faces on the Titantron in the backgrounds behind the faces I thought it looked pretty good oh you made a mistake tonight, Russo! You're letting me talk! Woo! That's good for me and bad for you! Woo! Is that right? Russo, you're a mark! A mark for the business and a mark for Rick Flair! A mark for Luger! A mark for Sting! And Douglas, the last time I looked, there was only one franchise in WCW. His name was Sting, and it's dead. Wow. And on a brief capsule synopsis, until you wrestled Terry by eye, Terry, and took the stadium, God rest his soul, in front of 50,000 people, or Bruce Bro Bruce Brody, God rest his soul, in the Budokan, that's Japan, until you wrestled Piper, Hogan, Sting, Bret Hart, Luger, until you wrestle them all, you can never be me. I am the way more money on bar tab than all three of you will ever make. Now that's a right there. I was there. We all were. And I'll do it again tonight, once again. Drinks are on the house, courtesy of the nation bar. Flair cuts a face promo bringing up their history in WCW and calls Russo a mark for the business, himself, Luger and Sting. He kills Douglas on the mic and successfully goads Russo into adding a stipulation to Flair's match with franchise at Slamboree, which is if Flair wins he gets Russo for five minutes. Let's see how big that You know what Rick? I guess this is the part of the show where I'm supposed to be the chicken heel, right? Well, I'll tell you what, Nate. I love your ass five minutes in the ring because when the night is over, I will own you. You see what, Rick? I'm not Wahoo. I'm not Dusty. I am Vince Russo, and it is my time. Wow. And you know why I will own you, Slick? I will own you because I got the big apples, baby. Wow. Hold on one second. I'm sorry, Nate. I've looked for this slime ball. This is about enough. I'll get you in one second. But you, Buff, 
Are you the same little punk right in the back seat behind Stig and I wanting to ride to the building? The same little punk want to roll away in bed? You save on expenses on the road? You're challenging and you're calling out six foot four, two seventy, four percent body fat and slammerie. Well, you got it, you little punk. What does uh, Mr. Package say? He said many wonderful things. He did. I mean, none of them particularly noteworthy. I mean, there is no mm. drinking milk. It's all unraveling. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I I was a huge Lex Luger fan in WWF. He's clearly gone a little bit downhill since then. <laughs> he wasn't doing a whole hell of a lot here. You know, Lex, let me tell you something. I'm real happy to see that you survived that fatal car crash known as the Lex Express. I liked in Flair's promo, which I thought was very funny and very entertaining. And Luke was doing a... <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. I did quite like the Russo comment, I'm sure he's hated it, about the Lex Express being a car crash. It was quite... I thought that was quite clever. Oh, oh, did you? Although I don't like when other companies bring up other companies' past. I think it's okay for if it's Luger talking about... Luger's time in WWF, you know, I think that's fine, but you know, like I don't think like Douglas should be out going, ah, oh, your Fed gimmick was shit. <laughs> Join <laughs> in the Nexus. <laughs> <laughs> he can talk with his Fed gimmick. <laughs> uh, Flair says he's been partying around the world, and Heenan says we've been there, and Shavante interjects, we've all been there. <laughs> I was there. We all were. Bollocks you have. <laughs> Who would go out drinking with Shavante? He just comes across yeah. as so angry and yeah. bitter and... Uh, just no fun. Yeah. yeah. Whatsoever. yeah. Like, yeah. Go on. Like, Tanae seems like a, a nice, mm. friendly guy. Where, yeah, Shavante. Miserable. Russo has security motion to forcibly bring Liz to the ring. The face is clean house with the security jobbers. Did you see one of them, the Kenny Powers looking fella, who half sells like a flare push? He goes, oh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing. He was kind of the only one in the ring and he looked really out of place. Because he had big fluffy heads yeah, yeah. and he had a t shirt and he had like, he didn't have slacks. Everyone has slacks except for him and he's just in his black sweatpants. Mm, like. His bumping pants. <laughs> <laughs> Russo dastardly absconds with Liz, presumably to tie her to a railroad and twirl his mustache. <laughs> um, I actually think he's a, he's a decent promo. I've I've written down here, despite this being a load of bollocks and the whole shoot thing being stupid and bad for business. It's actually a good promo. Like he, you could believe he is that good in the mic. He might actually be able to do something for WCW like you're unsure of how terrible it would be because at the point you could be mildly optimistic because he was touted as the brains behind Vince McMahon he had had all the ideas that brought about the Attitude Era right, that's what he says well he was able to convince <laughs> everyone and so yeah. you could be optimistic at this point and maybe he's got something here there's definitely something I'm interested in here although it didn't work out obviously but um, you weren't to know at the time it still could have gone either way Having grown up on 80s wrestling, Russo's recipe for success included figuring out ways to make Liz, 39 years old at the time, strip as a way to recoup some of her six-figure manager's contract. Fuck. So she had the right to refuse uh, any wrestling match. So she was ultimately sent home and do nothing where you'll make the exact same amount of money. Take that. So he never got her to strip? Nope. Mm-hmm. But who cares? It's 2000. Strip in 1989, misses, you know? Yeah. People watching would probably rather see other birds strip. Like, she wouldn't be on top of the list of all oh, yeah. these strips. Stacy, you know? Tori. Kimberly. Yeah. Yeah. Marquette and DDP still to come against Garrett and Eric Bischoff. DDP's world heavyweight title that he won on Monday in the balance there. And the exclusive interview with Bret Hart conducted by Scott Hudson in Calgary just yesterday. Still to come tonight on this program. I bet each and every one of you are wondering what I'm wearing under this robe. Yeah. Yes, we are. Go ahead. Or more importantly, what I'm not wearing. Show us, Tammy. 
Well, unlike that little tease, Paisley, I know what the men come to see. And right now, boys, I'm going to give it to you. Next up is Coked Up Sonny, aka Tammy Sitch, with Hard Knocks Chris Candido. This was under an hour in, I was fucking knackered watching this show. <laughs> the two were in a long time relationship, touring Smoky Mountain Wrestling, WWF, ECW, and now WCW together. He'd be best known as fitness wrestler Skip of the Body Donnas in the WWF's new generation era. Candido here, fucking jacked. There was no wellness. Chubby no, only WWF there. got stung with the steroid trial. Mm-hmm. But like, not ripped jacked, swollen jacked. He had a roid belly. <laughs> <laughs> and a bout of Cushing's. This promo is just sad, you know, the whole teasing, getting them out, and it's just... She's not looking... Well, she's still looking great, but... Mm. I think relatively she's had a, a rough bit weather beaten, like, yeah, yeah. Definitely. She's, she put on a bit of weight. Although her tits are huge. Yeah. They're way bigger than normal. Mm. I thought it was just a bit sad. Like, her sex appeal, it's like... Uh, you know, like, Scott Hall, when he tries to do the machismo thing in 2013, it's quite sad. Yeah. This is like a drunk stoned woman trying to do her sexy dance. And all you really want to do is cover up and buy her a cup of tea. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's quite sad. Did she always have that big, dirty hick accent in the WWF? Or did she just not speak in the WWF? No, well, she was, you know... Well, she wasn't clean, but she was professional enough on screen. I'd imagine that, that she was able to hide it a lot better. Like, uh, so she sounded her. like Californian. Okay, maybe. that's fine. Yeah, because like you know, one of the side effects of being a junkie isn't that you suddenly become southern. <laughs> he didn't ask for a dollar, inferring she's a whore. He should know better. Coke is a hundred and twenty dollars per gram. <laughs> 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 she's wrestling Paisley, aka Charmel. Uh, yes, Booker T's wife. This is her in-ring debut. Did you like her uh, Purple Rain ripoff song? Yeah. Coming in as Nitro Girl Storm, she broke off as the artist Prince IK's manager, redubbing herself Paisley. Is mm. Paisley a... The herb. <laughs> Not the herb. Not that herb. No, that's either. parsley. That's parsley. <laughs> Paisley. <laughs> Shut your fucking face, you Finian bastard. <laughs> okay, that's good. Oh, that Christ. I thought... I'll it... let you know, that's a quote from a prodigy, so... Oh, is it? Yeah. Mm. You know, like the is that not like... A do you know that condom? Yes! It's that fucking song, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. When, like, when the Pope came to Ireland in like 78 or 79, he was there in the Phoenix Park or something like, I'll break your fucking legs, you Finian bastard. And how did he not get hopped on? It's his opinion. <laughs> Did he have a, like a paisley mobile and just... <laughs> a parsley mobile. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> um, yeah, Christ. I thought the divas were bad. Holy shit. This has Tammy, who has the grace of fucking Jenna Maraska, supposedly leading this match. <laughs> Fighting the lady who had that match with Jenna Maraska. <laughs> the match is booked as a schmoz, but nothing can hide how inept these women are. Like, we get a third low blow by a woman tonight, a stone cold stunner, a fourth low blow by a woman, the China handspring elbow shtick, and after a DDT, Paisley wins in 322. The low blows on men, I understand. What's the advantage of a low blow on a woman? Well, it would still hurt. It would like, hurt. It'd be like getting a dig in the arm or something. You know, like, yeah. you've got your instant flare of pain, and then it'll go away. Yeah. It's not like getting a kick in the balls where yeah. you're on the ground vomiting. Like It's not even near the same. And wrestling logic d- dictates it doesn't hurt for women. Yeah. Asking about women's wrestling, Shavante admits he likes it in short spurts. And then we get the worst fucking work punches in the history of everything. And I was like, just fucking end. Paisley's head is here and she's like, eh, eh. <laughs> What's worse, those or the Jenna Maraska punches from the mount? Remember in the oh, TNA the- match where she did that? <laughs> <laughs> 
It's, it's difficult to our choose sh- on. Our show is getting a bit more visual. Because <laughs> 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 all you hear is... <laughs> <laughs> Backstage, Mean Gene interviews Booker, mentioning his match against US champion Scott Steiner at Slamboree. Their feud started on Monday. Uh, me and you. Uh, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, they're interrupted by some bleach blonde, a fake titted slut. Oh, that's a bit mean. Um, uh, <laughs> major guns. Not good looking. This is like Monday morning prostitute look. Mm. It's like pretty rough. It's rough, man. Yeah. Russo would turn Gene into a dirty old man towards the end of his run, and he'd be like, fumbly bumbly, you know. Steiner's freaks alert him to Booker, who joins the commentary team for the upcoming match. It's Face Booker T versus New Blood's Mike Awesome. So Awesome, he debuted at the reboot Nitro, Russo being swept up by the ECW hype and the non-existent bidding war for him. Man, good job, Mike. <laughs> Steiner goes off on Hogan and his this he had this speech about spots. Oh yeah, it was good, wasn't it? No, I got one old timer that comes out worrying about his spot. Crying more than Booker T is, I'm talking about Hulk Hogan worrying about a spot. Well, he can have his spot. His ball spot. Wow. <laughs> his limp gimp to the ring spot. His age spot. His non-athletic spot. You see us in the new blood? We're just not old enough to take his spot. So he can have his spot. What do you think about that, Bobby? I think you're right. I've always agreed with you. No, it's a great thing about Scott Steiner. He'll go out and do commentary. He won't be afraid. He'll just keep talking and talking and talking. And then somebody will kind of tell him to shut up and he'll just keep talking. That's uh, <laughs> God, He's fucking brilliant. Yeah, he should have a promo or a comment, be on the commentary desk once every show. Yeah, exactly. There's a cool spot where Booker attempts to do a leapfrog spot, but Awesome catches him and suplexes him. That's pretty cool. They just trade moves until the finish, when Steiner hits Booker with the US belt, giving Awesome the opportunity to hit a running Razor's Edge slash Awesome Bomb. And then a sexy pin, and the win. Sexy pin. 5 11. <laughs> sexy pin. He, he, he spreads his leg apart, and the old. <laughs> <laughs> the Awesome Bomb is horribly dangerous. That should not be allowed. Seamus does the very same move. Does he? And uh, he doesn't look half as dangerous. Yeah, he never yeah. made it look dodgy. But he kind of Seamus more throws them up, and they kind of land on their back. Like this lad was thrown Booker it's, almost into the ring post. It's disgusting. Like yeah. it's absolutely. It, it, it just shows a total lack of fucking care for yeah. who you're in there with, mm. and that's who you should care about the most because you're meant to keep the person that you're working with safe. Like if I hurt you, do I get over? That's it. (laughs) Steiner applies the Steiner recliner Mm -hmm. until the MIA misfits in action show up for the save. So this group was a bunch of mid-carders Russo had no intention of pushing and Booker T. They only formed the week prior on Nitro and were yet to get their army fatigues and hilarious parody names. I'll go through them. So Hugh Morris was General Hugh G. Rection. <laughs> like it. Booker T was GI Bro. Which is awesome. Okay. Van Hammer was Major Stash. Don't get it. He, he either has a huge bag of weed or a whopper mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Tylene, they're Major Guns. Chavo Guerrero is Lieutenant Loco. Oh, that's just shit. Yeah. Uh, Lash LaRue is Corporal Cajun. And the wall is Sergeant A Wall. Nice. I think that's the best one, isn't it? Best is a relative. <laughs> but like, you're obviously not. None of you are going anywhere no. with this. What about Sergeant Barry Cade? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <sighs> All right, next we got a Bret Hart interview. So it's a pre-taped interview with Bret Hart. Interesting going from Mania 9 to this angle. Hart gets over wanting to fight Hulk Hogan. Bret says the Hulkster's been ducking wrestling him to avoid losing to him and also refusing to pass the torch. 
He admits he may be retired from wrestling. He absolutely should not have said that at the start of this promo. You should never say that in wrestling. You should always leave the possibility that you might come back. You know but I, mean? I, I got the impression that he thought he might come back. And WCW must have thought he might come back. Or why have this interview? Yeah. Where he's essentially challenging Hogan. Yeah. So. Having a bit of a moan. <laughs> At December 99 Starcade, Goldberg inadvertently concussed Brett with a nasty mule kick, continuing to wrestle a heart heel turn, forming the silver NWO or NWO 2000s with Hull, Nash and Jarrett. However, weeks into it, he got more and more concussions and got post-concussion syndrome, so which would be like headaches, speech, loss concentration, memory loss, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity. Uh, Brett was forced to retire and the angle was dead in the water. It wouldn't work without Brett. His role in 2000 would be generally to cut promos both in-ring and pre-taped. So, what did you think of the promo? A real strange mixture between um, kayfabe and shoot. Um, talking about Hogan passing the torch to him. That's the exact point I've, I've heard. Go on. And, uh, but yet at the same time saying Hogan was scared because Brett would beat him in a legitimate wrestling match in the ring. It makes no sense. It doesn't. It's a contradiction. You take it in the real world. You take the torch off somebody. Exactly. They don't pass it to you. Why, if I am number one and I'm raking in the money, why would I ever give you the torch so that you could take my place? If you wanted, you take it from exactly. me. Exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. Came across very bitter as most Bret Hart interviews do, but I mean, he carried it quite well. You know, at least he wasn't stumbly and fumbly bumbly. Mm-hmm. I thought it was an excellent promo. I wanted to see the match, and that's the point of the promo, so it was great, despite being a bit strange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a definitely excellent use of merging kayfabe and reality. Sadly enough, the match never happened, so that that really sucks. I I generally disagree with using other companies' history in your feuds, in your company, but it's such a widely known instances in wrestling history, WrestleMania 9 and the Montreal Screwjob, that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You know? Why I don't like it is that your company is so weak that you can't and uh, mention your own accomplishments in the company. You have you have to reference their your other companies because that's why you bought them because of their previous star power. Not that you've made a star or continuing their star power. You're just leeching off previous star power. Yeah, and that sucks. And he essentially doesn't even mention anything from WCW. So he's been there a few years at this stage, but there's nothing worth mentioning really. Hmm. Sad. Hmm. So it's time for our main event. It's who <laughs> and <laughs> versus <laughs> and <laughs> with special guest referee. <laughs> It's Jeff Jarrett and Eric Bischoff. Uh, obviously, Jeff Jarrett and Eric Bischoff for <laughs> yeah. DDP. As if you couldn't get that from it. Like, it's obvious. <laughs> David Arquette's in tons of small snippets throughout the show, reminding us of the main event tag match. Bischoff and Jarrett taunt Arquette in the boiler room, dropping a 1-800 reference, as prior to Scream, Arquette was best known for doing many 1-800 call ATT ads. Willie Boss. <laughs> Later on, we'd see another segment with Bischoff and Jarrett taunting him, and then later, DDP finds him and tries to get him to seek medical advice, which he refuses. They get over how Arquette's battered, especially with his injured ribs. You're not coming. You got it? All right, I got it. Well, the beer was all hidden up, okay? Got it? He's going out by himself? I don't I think so. If this was real life, DDP would have overheard him and turned around and said what are you doing I just told you no so you know you'd have put the fucking law down so yeah called bullshit on this segment 
<laughs> but <laughs> once you go out of camera shot, you disappear. Yeah. <laughs> you fail to exist. It's true. It's true. Uh, brilliant. So Bischoff has Kimberly Page as a special guest referee. Uh, Steve, do you want to take us through it? So the first thing I have here is the fucking cut of Bischoff. <laughs> yeah. State of your clothes, mate. <laughs> what was he wearing? Black sweatpants and a black top and he cut off the shoulders or something. He looked ridiculous. Next, uh, we have DDP with his shameful uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit ripoff, which is actually amazing. It's great. David Arquette comes out after changing the selling of his injury throughout the entire night. Whoa, go through the selling of that? Do you, do you want me to go through it here? Right. In the first backstage segment, right side on okay. his arm. And then he goes to no selling, and then he moves to his right arm. And then on the fourth go, he is selling his right arm. <laughs> Continuity! <laughs> and then in the next one, his ribs on his left side. And then no selling at first, and then cops, and then sells his left ribs. So then when he makes his entrance for the main event, he finally comes out and he's not selling anything! <laughs> so in this main event of your show, immediately going to time wasting. Jared and Paige kick off the match as Bischoff battles uh, Mr. Cox on the outside. And then the both of those lads fight to the back and they're gone. Great. Kimberly Page at a couple of spots where she refuses to count Jarrett after taking a DDT from Page. And then a couple of seconds later, Jarrett gets a pinning opportunity. And of course, it's the typical one, two, three quick heel pin. Bischoff comes back out to the ring for a two on one advantage on DDP. It's at this point where the crowd finally come alive and start chanting for DDP. DDP gives Kimberly Page a kiss as David Arquette comes back to the ring and spears Eric Bischoff. Jared hits DDP with the belt. Uh, Kimberly is out cold from a kiss. And as she's out cold and the schmoz is going on, the camera keeps her in picture as she starts to fix her hair. And uh, she's just absolutely not selling being out cold from her kiss. Jared covers DDP, a new ref runs in and instead counts David Arquette's pinfall rather than Jared, despite Jared and DDP clearly being the legal man for the entirety of the match. And as a result, David Arquette is announced the new WCW champion as Shavante says with absolute disgust <laughs> that this man is our new champion. Uh, Heenan is obviously pissed off too. And Tanae just flat out says fucking nothing. So, uh, that is the match. Gordy Boggs fulfills his lifelong dream and becomes WCW champion in under four minutes. Uh, tiny bit of pyro and get the fuck out of the arena. <laughs> Uh, the Ready to Rumble song plays us out over replays of the finish. And then Shafante ends it with... What's Courtney going to say? What's Hollywood going to say? What are we going to do with David Arquette, our champion? Wow. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. What do you think, lads? I mean, there's not a huge amount to say, really. It's... There is. <laughs> 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 there's a lot to say. <laughs> It's a sad day for wrestling. Um, I can only hope that everyone involved regretted it pretty much immediately afterwards. You know, regardless, of course it was a fluke win. Um, he didn't come across as strong in the slightest, but he's still a world champion. The world champion. Who would that entice to watch WCW? Exactly. Uh, yeah, idiot company disgraces self. <laughs> Who's going to check it out? <laughs> Champion shouts at cloud. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's all well and good Tuesday morning, but what happens Tuesday evening? What happens Wednesday morning? This is the most embarrassing champion that's ever been crowned in a mainstream wrestling promotion. All right, so everyone at the time involved with Ready to Rumble weren't happy with the box office receipts because it cost $24 million to make, not counting advertising. It brought in $12 million. Shit, a man. So one day, Tony Schiavone jokingly suggested Arquette should win the belt, and that way they can cross-promote the movie on TV. And Russo said, oh, that's fucking great. Let's do it. And no one told him no. Should have been a red flag right there. When your booker goes, yes, 
You have a problem. It's like you have a huge problem. They did it just to get some mainstream press, and they did. They got a small picture and a write up in USA Today. But what does that get you? A small picture and a write up in the USA Today. <laughs> like um, for one day, people will read that. Hey, this company fucked over itself. Was uh, it on uh, the front page? Uh, page six, maybe. That, that's not. It's not. That's not worth a wank. <laughs> Or a sooty bum. Or a sooty bum. <laughs> at the... This is the definition of short-term booking. And this is like, you're good for 12 hours. <laughs> this did, will be good. Did they even get a bump the next night, Joe? Did? Oh. Uh. So it was just immediately everything went down. People went away in their droves. They got pissed off. Wasn't our cat really embarrassed about it and didn't want it to happen? And mm-hmm. you know, yeah, he was a huge wrestling fan and knew that wrestling fans would hate an actor being the champion. And he said, "No, absolutely not." And Russo was like, "Ready to rumble? It's not selling well. We need to co-promote it. This will get us in the New York Times. It will get us in the New York Post. It will get us in the USA Today. Uh, it'll be good for the business. Will you help out WCW? Will it help out Ready to Rumble in the film?" And he's like. Okay, all right, all right. I can't think of anything more stupid than putting your world title on an actor. I can't think of it. And it's like a £140 actor as well. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got Arnie who plays the part of monsters and beasts and Terminators, and you know, at least the fans can give a little bit of leeway and say, well, maybe Arnie is playing those parts because he's really tough, you know? I've got to say, we'll save the business. Going to put... The WCW world title on Oliver Platt. <laughs> Jimmy King. They are placid. Actually. No, I'm not thinking that's a good idea. He's, he's a, a better, successful actor. Yes. And he's better than you know, he's better than yes. David Arquette. The best possible outcome is that people will see David Arquette and might go to see the movie. But I can't imagine people seeing this and like, oh, I had to start watching WCW. Anything can happen. <laughs> you know? But anything did happen. They got Courtney Cox and Kurt Russell to do a free promo. That's awesome. Like, to me, that's... There, I got it. I, the proof. Proof it works. <laughs> to me, that means more than your mainstream media attention and you're getting in the paper. Having two famous people say WCW... I, th- I think it's well. Now, obviously, it's not worth doing what they did. It killed the company. <laughs> Just to get Courtney Cox <laughs> and Kurt Russell to say to get see Mrs. Me. Cox. And, uh, oh, hold on. What the fuck was Kurt Russell doing? Uh, it talking was, about it was, WCW? It was, a se- it was a segment where the Arquette and he's backstage at his studio a lot and he's like, yeah, I'm fucking champion. And Courtney Cox is going, you're not champion. This is stupid. And Kurt Russell's like, hey, how's it going? And, you know, goes into his trailer. Is that is that the promo? Yeah. Oh, God! <laughs> you mortgaged the company, Steve. Yeah. It's oh, my fault. God. You wanted it. It's my you got fault. It. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> did you think of this edition of WCW Thunder? A lot. <laughs> I thought lots about this show. Um, so I'll just go through what I thought was good. Right off the bat, excellent recap. I felt like I had a decent grasp of what was going on, who was here. Well, I kind of proved that I didn't in the show, actually. <laughs> but, uh, you know, going into the show, I felt like that was a good intro. Um... I enjoyed the opening. Like uh, I'm a huge fan of Jarrett. I think DDP is okay. It's a decent storyline, the way they'd set up the tag match. Most importantly, this is all new to me, so that's great. I thought that the Russo and Flair promo, despite being stupid in you know the fact that it's a shoot and it's kind of silly, I thought that both men gave their promos fantastic. I thought the Brett promo was excellent, and Scott Steiner doing anything is great. Uh, so onto the bad Ernest fucking Miller everything about him his look his wrestling ability his promos his James fucking Brown everything was awful interference 
and outside brawling in every fucking match. There wasn't a single thing that was clean. Horace Hogan. <laughs> Tank Abbott. The Wall. <laughs> Sting being a big, dirty indie wrestler, trying to hit the same move twice in a row. The Women. Fuck, that was awful. David Arquette selling. And of course, the very idea that they put the world title on an actor is just boggles my mind. There was a lot of bad, but I was very entertained. I wasn't bored for a second watching th- this show. It's technically a terrible show, but I enjoyed it. For once, I think we're pretty much in total agreement. Uh, the only thing was the promo package at the start. So you only agree with most of that. <laughs> I couldn't follow it. It was just too much in your face and... This is what's happening. This is what's happening. This was all right. All right. Shh. But one thing I really liked was the star power in general and these stars that we either haven't seen previously or haven't seen in a while or wanted to see at their peak. For a first kind of WCW show, yeah, I'd, I'd watch another one. It's just as bad as you're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> I love Jarrett, just like Steve, and it's great to see him at the top of the tree and at the top of a... I wouldn't say successful company at this point, but a very prominent company and one that's watched by many people. Sure, like, you know, at the end of the day, it's still the second biggest wrestling company there's ever been. So, you know, at the very least, he's like the top dog in the slightly smaller pool. I agree with most of them. None. (laughs) (laughs) You are fucking thick. Like, it was quite a crash course in crash TV here. But I'm really looking forward to watching uh, Slambury because it'll be the same angles here, but it'll be wrestling heavy. So it'll be much better paced. Mm, yeah. Definitely, yeah. Mm. All right, so I think it's time we take us to the wrestling is... <laughs> you totally win that round. <laughs> <laughs> Segment. Awesome. I can feel, I can feel the presence of Almighty God in this room. Oh, the swagger is coming all upon us, isn't it? Ooh, oh yeah. Crazy Keith, are you crazy for Jesus? Amen. Are you jacked up on Jesus? I am. I am. I'm feeling almighty Jesus in this room. Are y'all hearing me? Let's all rise. Let's all rise and get a good amen. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Who will champion? Oh, here's Jeff Jarrett. Wait up, Jeff. Hey, Stat Nuts. Would you call me? Stat Nuts. You know who you're talking to? Yeah, you. Stat Nuts. So that'll do it for this week, folks. David Arquette is champion and Thunder is in the books. Good stuff, man. Yes, it was. Mm-hmm. Felt good. <laughs> Next up, it's the final part of the trilogy. It's the return of the Jimmy King with the... That's false advertisement. <laughs> Jimmy King's not in this fucking show. <laughs> He's a ghost. <laughs> Slambery 2000 featuring the Triple Cage match. So remember, you can catch all of our episodes, fuck FOC, free of charge and an IMAX flavored for the free full screen at OSWReview.com. Like us on Facebook, also at OSWReview.com, and leave us a lovely message. Why not, you sooty bums? <laughs> <laughs> So it's a goodbye from Mr. OC. And V1. And myself, Jay Hunter. And remember. I can't do it. A winner is you. Oh, how many pages do you have? I've like four. I also think that uh, some reason that I've got so many notes because I was really looking forward to watching the show, I was kind of hyped for it. I was ready for it. You're sitting there. Come on, yeah. As a bum was sudden up. 
The old sooty bomb, sooty bomb, mate. <laughs> This is my world. Wait a minute, what are the rules you have to tell us, brother? All right, drivers, this is how it's going to be. The circle of the perimeter here, there are two charges. The vibrations of the truck can make it go off, or you can run over it. Unless it disables that truck, you keep on running them. With the end of this glass up, I want the truck to be completely out of the ring. That doesn't mean one set axle, that means two sets of axles. So the truck has to be completely out, all the way to the bumper. When you see those bumpers come in here, we're going to weld them shut. Now I want to be on the top of that truck, when you see my hand and those charges go off, I'm going to jump off that bumper and the, may the best truck win, so go for it! I'm going to win! Oh, yes, yes, you're going to win! Yes, you're going to win! Oh, this is it. This is it. Basically, the rules, let me reiterate for you, if I may. You need to get both sets of axles out of that circle in order to be declared the winner. And did I understand him correctly, Bobby, to say that there are two charges place randomly within that circle? Is that what I heard? Well, if, if this thing runs on alcohol, there could be an explosion out there. I wouldn't want that truck to be anywhere near any pyro, any charges. Hogan could wind up in Toronto. Bob Chandler, as we're looking on, they are literally welding these two trucks together. There is no escape. Now it's going to be a battle to the finish here. We're gonna, what's going to happen? How much gas, how much oil? Uh, Alcohol. alcohol. How big are the gas tanks? They held uh, about 15 gallons apiece, and if they do, if the charge goes off by that alcohol, they're goners. I mean, they, you got a guy with a welder there. All right, you are looking at the top of Cobo Hall, Cobo Arena, adjacent to the Joe Lewis Arena here. We have got helicopters, we've got police, and now we have the world's first ever monster sumo match. Come on, Bischoff. You almost sound surprised that there has never been a sumo monster truck match before. That's like being surprised that there was never a killer whale on a pole match. Wait, WCW never had a killer well in a pole match, right? And they're not wearing any, uh, they're not wearing helmets. I don't think they have seat belts in that thing, Bob. Oh yeah, they got seat belts. Huh? They'll be okay in the truck, as long as they don't go off the edge of the building. They are strapped in. Now, Bob, you told me there are two set, both sets of axles actually turn in this. Well, on, on each of these trucks, you'll notice the back wheel steer and the front wheel steer. You've got a co-pilot pilot situation here. I yeah. tell you what, this is gonna be like flying the space shuttle. It is, it's tough because the, the one guy has to steer the rear tires and take care of the hydraulics. The other guy, Hulk, is going to steer the, the front axle, do the transmission, do the, the uh, uh, gas pedal, the brake. So it's a battle in there. It is a battle, and right now it is Hulk Hogan taking the monster all the way back. He is, he is pushing. He is digging in. It has been raining, sprinkling here in Detroit for the last couple of days, and now you're getting an inside look. The monster. His point of view, he is pushing Hogan back. Hogan only appears to be about 15 feet away from the edge, but again, maneuvering those back axles, shifting the torque, shifting the weights of the trucks around. I expected Hogan to be a little slow because he's, this is fairly new to him. He hasn't driven this that much, but he's doing a great job. We always expect Hogan to be slow, and he never lets us down. <laughs> That's good. Hulk Hogan keeping the action in the center. There you see our aerial cam. We have got a helicopter circling the roof, and again, we got to tell you, we are five stories up above, and you can see the flashing lights just beyond that, a brick wall, just beyond that is Windsor, Canada, and nothing in between it other than a parking lot and a river. Oh, look at this! Here Hogan's we go. going back! Hogan is back! They didn't get both tires out. They got to get him all the way out before they win. So. Only, yeah, that's right, only one set of wheels, and now Hogan, and just, you can hear the roar of these vehicles. Bob, if they weren't hooked together, and they were like in the Bonneville salt plants, how fast can one of these trucks go? Well, they drive about 100 miles an hour, Bobby. Oh, look at this, Hogan now. Oh. Hogan just about hey, out. This is exciting. Hogan, now it looks to me like Hogan is, is positioning the monster towards the center. He may be trying to swing him out of here, Bob. That's, what he, that's a good angle if he can do that. He can swing him around and get some momentum going. He can swing him all the way out, the, all the way out of the ring. And now Hogan going back again. And I'll tell you what, this Dungeon of Doom truck is one frightening looking machine. But what would you expect? I think Hogan's going to have the horsepower to cart by the time we're through. We did a lot of work on this truck, and uh, he should win this. Is, is that rain there on the roof, or was Hogan just nervous earlier? <laughs> Look at this, Hogan going back again. Hogan going back and we have a charge. We have a charge. 
they almost hit, got him all the way out. They hit one of those random place charges, and you can't tell. It doesn't appear that there's been any damage done to the truck. There's our aerial shot again. We have the fire department is up here. We have ambulances. And I'll tell you, God they go willing, off, we won't need them. If they go off that rooftop into the river, you won't find them for months. In 1995, the movie Apollo 13 came out in theaters. Even though it came out 18 years ago, I'm still holding out on watching it. I never saw the first 12 Apollo movies and have no idea what's going on. Monster sumo trucks doing what has never been done before. And you are seeing it at Halloween Havoc as you get a good look at Hogan and he is really muscling this truck. It must be hard to hold on to this machine, Bob. It is, there's a lot, lot going on with that size tire and that, that much weight. Oh, I think he's look got it, though. He's look got it. He's got it. He's, got he's, got he's got gonna take him out. Back. He won it. There he's he got it. Got it. Oh, oh, wheels off. And inside. He's not stopping, though, is he? Inside the building, the crowd reacting. I don't know if you're catching that at home. I'll tell you, WCW has changed the course oh, look of the He's nuts! He crawled out of He's going after Hogan! Oh. Oh, we're gonna have it right up on the roof. Wait a minute! No, there is no security. We don't have enough security up there for this. He's gonna throw him off the roof, Bishop. No, 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 no. He's no. gonna throw him No, 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 oh, they no. are at the edge of the roof. Oh, whoa, whoa. You better get the firemen out there with the nets. The giant has got Hulk Hogan on the edge of the roof of Cobo Hall. Oh my, oh get no, the, oh get no. Him off of that. Somebody get him off of there. I get him look. off of there. No, no. Oh my God. No. Oh no, help, help. No. 